Hello, welcome. And today we have this beautiful machine here. Um, some of my German viewers probably recognize it immediately. It was a very iconic PC from the early 1990s. And this exact machine, not this particular machine, but this exact model, let's say, was our family's first um, self-owned computer, basically. We had one that we lent before, but this was the machine that we bought. It was um, one of already the more expensive machines back in 1993 when we got this. It is a uh, Phobis high screen Colani 486SX25. Okay, that's a mouthful. Let's explain this. In the early 90s in Germany, there were two big computer brands or stores, store chains called Phobis and Escom. They were relatively cheap, let's say. They would sell all-in-one packages similar to what Dell would do in the US. We also had Dell and Gateway and other computer manufacturers, but uh, Phobis and Escom were genuinely German manufacturers. Phobis had their own line of computers under the label High Screen, which is this here, um, and the company was called Phobis. They had stores all over uh, Germany. And back in the early 1990s, um, they did a collaboration with the famous industrial designer Colani. I think his name was Luigi Colani, I think. He was famous for doing round off organic style um, themed things. He designed trucks, cars, motorcycles, but also these front plates for regular beige box and also tower um, PCs and things like that. As you can see, this thing here is particularly yellowed, so we will do some retro writing. There used to be a warning sticker here um, that you shouldn't uh, swap out the hard disk without powering off and turning the uh, key here, uh, which I luckily have. So yeah, there's a hard disk in here. We have one 1.4 megabyte, 3.5 inch disk. We have one 1.2 megabyte, five and a quarter inch disk and a 486SX25, not a particularly fast machine. There's also no cache in here, if I remember correctly. It comes with a VGA card, multi-IO, and that's about it. Um, we will open it up, of course. We will test run it, uh, we will clean it, but I will leave it more or less stock as it is. I will probably put a sound card in here to make it more fun to play games on. Um, back in the day, at some point I put in a 500 megabyte hard disk, but I will leave the 100 megabyte hard disk that's in here just as it is, because I do have the 486DX33, which is my main test and play machine. And this will be um, fired up every couple of weeks for nice occasions. So I will leave it more or less intact as it is. Um, back in the day, as I said, I added a 500 megabyte hard disk. I upgraded the RAM eventually to 8 megabytes. I swapped out the processor for a DX33 variant. I think it might have been able to do the DX266 perhaps with clock doubling. And I also back in the day installed 256 kilobyte of cache. There are sockets on board, but they are not populated. Um, but I think I will leave it out because if I only use it once in a while, it's not really necessary. Um, it will, of course, not run any FPU intensive games because the 486SX doesn't have an FPU. You can add the FPU only on this board only by um, swapping out the CPU. Um, also, 487SX uh, FPUs are pretty rare and they are relabeled or basically repackaged 486DX anyway disabling the main CPU, so that doesn't make much sense. Turning this thing around, you can have a look. It does have a classic AT style power supply. I already uh, tested the machine and it's still working good, so there's no need to do anything about that, I think. 
Um, here you can see the multi-IO card with one parallel port, two serial ports, and the VGA um, card in here, which is, uh, all of these are pretty box standard, no name, Trident and multi-IO branded things. Uh, that's the focus quality control seal, and um, yeah, I think there's not much else going on here. There are some faceplates back here for extra ports. Um, yeah, there's one screw missing over here, but other than that, the whole thing looks in pretty nice condition. Interesting enough, um, same happened with my machine. There's a uh, dent here, which makes it a bit hard to get the case off. But yeah, other than that, it's in, in a pretty okay shape for a machine that just turned 30 years old. So um, next up, I would say we open up the case, have a look inside, and take off the faceplate very carefully, uh, because it, we have it's many different parts for the disk drives, for the hard disk here. And yeah, it's actually quite interesting. Before you can open the case, you need to take out the hard disk because it's uh, locked in place and you can swap out the hard disk, which is interesting. You could basically buy a second one of these trays here and uh, for example, run different operating systems and stuff like that, if you were so inclined. <laughs> This is the inside of the machine. Um, as you can see, here's the graphics card. It's a, let me check it, Trident TVGA 9000B with probably 512 kilobytes of RAM. So not a great video card, but I think it was the same that I had. Here's the multi-IO card with IDE and floppy controllers in parallel and serial ports. The 486SX is here. Funny enough, the board also supports the 386DX in QFP uh, packaging. Uh, there's one empty socket here for whatever purposes. There's the jumper block for configuring which uh, processor is installed, etc. It's a wire chipset and down below I can see the um, sockets for the cache memory and I see a bunch of empty SIM sockets, so there are eight SIM sockets for possibly eight megabytes of RAM at least. Um, the floppy disk drives are in very good condition, I would say. I think this part here I don't need to retrobrite. Um, this part here I will try to take off. Uh, there's the connectors for the reset and turbo and key lock uh, switches. So let's see if we can get this off because this is pretty yellowed. Um, and I would like to have it matching the case after retrobiting. I will also try to take this apart if possible um, to get the plastic out of here. It's, it seems to be one plastic thing with a top and bottom metal shell. Um, so we can bleach this here. And turning it around a bit. Uh, this is where you could actually insert a second uh, hard disk basically. There, I think in my machine there was actually kind of like a mounting thing. Um, there's a screw post here, there's something to hold and something to slide into, which is missing here. So I figure there was something in here and somebody took it out. Um, so if you wanted to add another hard disk to this, it's a bit difficult because you won't fi easily find the, the plate here for mounting. Mm, would need a little bit of luck, I would say. Yeah, uh, we can probably also salvage one of the screws here for the missing case screw, um, because these face plates will hold in place differently. Or, or maybe I have one in my uh, box of screws and stuff. Yeah, but that's basically all there is to it. It's a pretty compact design, pretty neat uh, 
little but still bulky machine. Um, these are the custom uh, things for the uh, eject buttons. This one here has a little bit of plastic broken off, so it's already getting brittle. Be careful and keep track of these because they get lost easily. Okay, I'm gonna unscrew the face plates here and try to retrobrite them. So this uh, front part here comes off relatively easily with two screws, but there are the uh, yeah the the uh, buttons for reset and turbo, and there are two uh, LEDs which you can loosen with this screw. And I will take all of this out as well as the key lock, obviously. The power switch I'm gonna leave in. I think there's nothing much to it. Doesn't look very yellowed either because it's underneath um, the actual button. And as usual, with AT style power supplies, this is the actual uh, mains that are switched here with this thick cable instead of the um, power switch on ATX, which just sends a signal to the power supply. So I went on and disassembled the whole of the plastic parts, rinsed it off with a lot of water, and filled a big tub from IKEA with uh, water from the hose, basically, and poured in a couple of liters of H2O2 and let it sit in the sun for a whole day. And yeah, let's uh, see how it turned out. <laughs> the status after more than or almost let's see yeah roughly seven hours in the sun I used some uh, screws that are zip tied on the back and plus a couple more on the front here um, to make it more heavy because it was floating to the top but as you can see it is already much better it's not perfect in person you can see still a little bit of yellowing and uh, here where the um, sticker was there's definitely a brighter patch also weighed down the button panel with a couple of stones um, the HD enclosure is actually pretty okay um, it helps if you take it out and then drop it back in so that the bubbles go away I think um, this will be fine in like half an hour or an hour I will take it out and I think that's good enough for now I can redo it in a couple of years when it starts to yellow again. But I think um, it already looks a million times better than the very yellowed appearance it had this morning. So a couple of days are gone and um, I think, can I get this in shot, uh, the plastics look pretty nice. In person it still looks a bit yellowed, but I'm gonna leave it at that for the moment because yeah, I think it's fine. It's much better than it was before. And I'm gonna put this whole thing back together. But before we do that, I have one small addition to this thing. This here is the same type, maybe even brand, of sound card that I got um, for my own money, um, basically, back when I was, let me think, 15? maybe 1994 I think it was um, yeah I played like one or two years without any sound cards and stuff 
and I wanted a sound card so bad. Um, by 1994, they got relatively cheap, plus CD-ROM technology was taking off. So um, I got this card here, which is based on the uh, MediaVision Jazz 16 sound chip, together with some additional chips that were also um, on the famous Pro Audio Spectrum 16. And um, the special thing here was that this thing could do 16-bit CD audio quality uh, sound output and also recording. Wasn't used really by any games, but uh, yeah, you could do it if you wanted to. Especially when listening to like mod files from the demo scene, that was pretty nice to have. And much cheaper than a Gravis Ultrasound at the time, at least here in Germany. It still had a volume wheel like that. It does have a genuine OPL3 synth, so um, DOS compatibility was great. It was not compatible to the um, Sound Blaster 16 or to the uh, Pro Audio Spectrum per se, so uh, it was its own standard, but it was compatible to the Sound Blaster Pro 2.0, which was good enough for DOS games, and Windows games would just use the drivers for this card. So we can put it in here, and uh, while I'm talking about that thing, uh, where do we put it? Perhaps here in the middle, so we have nice, a lot of room. But while we're talking about this card, um, I bought this card together with a CD-ROM drive, which I put into this machine, or, the, well, the machine that we had back at the time, destroying the looks of it, basically. I'm gonna show you in a second, um, but I took out the five and a quarter inch um, floppy drive, basically, which is a shame, but I couldn't afford a completely new computer um, and to me the floppy drive back then wasn't that important actually anymore uh, because I still had a floppy drive the three and a half inch of obviously plus I did have the um, CD-ROM drive and that was pretty neat but if I had known that these things got so collectible nowadays and I had enough money as a kid, which I didn't, um, I would have kept it all original and tried to figure out something different. Let me fetch the CD-ROM drive as well. So this is the CD-ROM drive I had back in the day. Again, not this exact same device, but the same model and make. It's a Mitsumi FX001D, D for double speed. There was also a 001S for single speed and a later version that did, I think, uh, quad speed, basically. Um, but I think that was the FX400 or something. And for that to fit, I had to remove this beautiful faceplate here, uh, which clips out, which is fine. But then you would have like this, well, recessed CD-ROM drive in there, which would work fine, but it was a bit lame looking, to say the least. And um, the CD-ROM drive came with this interface card, which is a proprietary Mitsumi drive um, interface card. The CD-ROM drives back then, at least in the beginning, were not IDE or ATA or ATAPI compatible. They were either SCSI drives, which were more expensive and you needed a SCSI controller, or these kinds of drives from Mitsumi and similar, Sony, etc. And usually you would also um, optionally have the interface on the CD-ROM card because people would buy both at the same time. But my card and my drive were such a budget solution that even that wasn't the case. So yeah, we do have the drive here, but we're gonna leave it out as I don't want to ruin the looks of the computer this time. So let's close this up and um, let's try it out.
So here is the machine propped up a little bit precariously on my desk. And before we start it up, and hopefully nothing explodes, I do actually have the original manuals, uh, like the service card for the warranty uh, and everything in here from high screen slash Vobis. The quick start, basically, uh, which explains how to set up the machine. Uh, explained here with the tower computer actually, but there's also the desktop variant here. So that's all more or less good. And what you used to get uh, was a big cardboard box with tons of manuals and uh, floppy disks with all the pre-installed software, because of course they would bundle a bunch of that stuff. And I think I might have one or two um, manuals that came with this thing, but definitely not the whole box here. The TVGA 9000 card manual for the rather cheap VGA card and the Moti.io card. That's that. I've got the drivers for the sound card here, so we can perhaps hear a little bit of its uh, prowess. And I'm gonna try and turn this on and switch to the um, OSC as well. Good news, the power up at least works. The system boots up with the award modular BIOS. And yeah, it seems all okay. I also put in 128 kilobytes of cache memory that I had lying around. So let's run a couple of benchmarks and see what this thing can actually do. Remember, this is an SX without an FPU. And here's a quick overview with the uh, PC Tools 7.1, I think, system information. And it shows that we have the 486SX25 megahertz with a 512K VGA. Well, it doesn't say on this page, but on another page. The hard disk is 128 megabytes in size. We have two floppy disks. We have eight megabytes of memory in total with DOS memory and extended memory. I maxed it out um, in the same way that I did back in the day be able to put in more than 8 megabytes by using 4 megabyte sims, but I don't think it's very useful or desirable. Even with OS 2 or something like that, you would have been fine with 8 megabytes. So I'll leave it at that. The uh, machine is installed with MS-DOS 5.0, which is the same version that it came with when I bought it back in the day, and I think that's pretty appropriate. The CPU speed is uh, significantly less than a 486DX33 because I think this also measures floating point performance. Uh, Pentium 66 is uh, very much like four times faster than this, mainly due to, due to the FPU but also due to different optimizations obviously and having more than twice the clock speed. But uh, the 486SX25 definitely is quite a bit faster than a 386DX33 which would have been a contemporary option that you could buy if you were on a budget. The hard disk speed is not very fast. It's 360 kilobytes per second and an average seek time of almost 15 milliseconds. Obviously, a compact flash card would have been uh, quite a bit faster, at least for the average seek time, but the uh, data transfer rate would probably be not that much faster due to the 16-bit ISA controller. If uh, you were to have a Visa local bus system from around that era, that would have been much faster given a Visa local bus IDE controller, obviously. All in all, this machine is roughly 50% faster than a 386EX33 and about maybe 20% slower than a 486EX33. This, of course, can be tuned a little bit. We can replace the SX CPU for a DX CPU. That's totally possible. Also with higher clock frequency if we exchange the oscillator on the board. But I'm not going to do that um, because this will not be my main machine. And this way it stays relatively original with uh, the original CPU and main components, so to speak, just with upgraded RAM and cache memory. Speaking about cache memory, I installed 128 kilobytes of cache, uh, also adding a tag RAM. And yeah, uh, as you can see in the bottom right corner, um, memory is quite fast, up to 8 kilobytes due to the level 1 cache of the 486. 
and then it goes down a little bit to 18 and a half megabytes up to 128 kilobytes in size and then it goes down to 11.7 for the main memory which is connected via a much slower bus looking at some games i have to start with monkey island 2 which was one of my favorite games or maybe the favorite game of my childhood i adored this adventure and yeah it runs perfectly fine i started playing this back on a 286 which was also pretty okay, um, wasn't too slow. I think the 286 was the minimum requirement for Monkey Island 2. Monkey Island 1 would even run on an XT class PC. Um, but here, yeah, the 46 uh, doesn't struggle at all with this. Uh, the graphics are not too demanding. The J16 sound card is pretty nice having the original OPL3 chip. So yeah, let's listen a little bit. Another great favorite of that era was for many people Comanche, the 3D action helicopter simulator thingy I would say, uh, which was important as it came with the first voxel based engine which made the landscape look relatively realistic for the time. Here in the 486SX it is a bit lagging and low frame rate. This is hardly due to the CPU, I would say. I think the main limiting factor is the slow ISA card. A friend of mine had a 486DX266, but with a VESA local bus, and Comanche would run super smooth. Uh, it's not terrible here, it's still pretty impressive that it can do the frame rate that it does, but it's definitely much less smooth than I remembered it when playing it on a friend's computer. Similar here with uh, Lucasfilm's or LucasArts X-Wing game. It works pretty fine and even the 3D scenes uh, work nicely. But having a faster graphics card is definitely something to be yeah, desired. Um, but still, we played X-Wing on this machine quite a lot and it was quite a bit of fun, especially when you have sound card. And of course, my favorite jump and run game on the PC platform ever, Jazz Jack a Ripbit by Epic Mega Games, actually, uh, who are still around and bigger than ever. And I love this game for many different reasons. It was basically Sonic on steroids with guns and uh, faster running and jumping. And the smooth scrolling is actually pretty impressive for the PC, as it lacks a lot of hardware that the Mega Drive and similar systems had. But they managed to pull it off, and uh, also the music in demo scene tracker format is absolutely brilliant. So, this is the Colani High Screen 486SX25. Um, the very same model of computer that our family had as their first computer. And what do I think about it? Well, it's definitely a neat little machine, very compact. I thought it gave pretty good performance for its price back in the day. And yeah, I love that I have this machine back in my possession, at least one of the same uh, build. I think it has a slightly different mainboard in there. It definitely has a different BIOS. Um, I used to have an AMI BIOS, whereas this has an award BIOS. But all the other stuff seems to be roughly the same thing. And um, while this won't be my daily driver in retro PC gaming and programming and stuff, I rather prefer my new ATX build, which is much more silent. I will turn this on every couple of weeks or months um, to just get a feel of how things used to be. Um, it is built to a price point. There are no high-end components in here. I do love the organic style of the Colani uh, front plate for sure. So that's a nice thing. But that's it for today. 
Um, please share your stories about um, your first family computers, uh, what they were, where they ended up, maybe you still have them. But that's it for today. It's also starting to rain outside. You might hear that over the noise of the fans. So if you enjoyed this, leave a comment, share, like, subscribe. Definitely share on social media. That helps always to bring in new people um, who are interested in this hobby. If you want to support me, links are down in the description. But um, yeah, see you next time. Bye.